This is uh, my uh, fifth conference. Uh, my wife and I, Marie, is sitting here is going to laugh at me if I fall on something. Uh, we've been coming, this is my fifth year. The, uh, I'm an, I was an infectious disease specialist in Milwaukee, uh, diagnosed with uh, IBM in 2008. I had symptoms clearly that I knew something was wrong, but uh, thought it was more related to some sciatica I had since 2002, even before that, maybe. And uh, the main thing I was noticing over those years in the uh, between was when I got down on the floor and said, get something on the couch, I couldn't get up again. It was more and more difficult. So uh, I thought it was the Lipitor that was doing it to me, but it wasn't the Lipitor. And so uh, I walked into uh, a uh, neuromuscular neurologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, to see what I had. She, just from hearing my story and examining me, she said, I, I think you have IBM, we're going to confirm it with some tests, including a biopsy. And so, uh, uh, stumbled on the TMA website uh, a year or two later, and uh, uh, over the years they've asked me to be on board, and, uh, uh, and maybe I would give a talk. So uh, this talk is, uh, here it's called the Myositis and Infection. Uh, Basically, it's uh, the immune system as seen by an infectious disease specialist as opposed to as seen by a rheumatologist or a neurologist. Uh, one of the very first sessions uh, that we went to back in 2011 was Myositis 101, which you're missing right now. It's going to be repeated later. Uh, and Dr. Worden was the uh, speaker that we heard then, and he uh, uh, went through about myositis and described the various forms of myositis and how inflammation uh, was a bad thing, and we use medications to defeat inflammation. Uh, but I'm sitting there as an infectious disease specialist, and I know that inflammation is a good thing to have when you're fighting infection. And so I thought it would be a different wrinkle to see what's going on from the infection side. And so uh, I gave this talk last year. Is anybody here to hear this last year? It's going to be the same old jokes as last year. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, with, uh, well, a few little, very minor changes, but it's already on the website from last year, so uh, uh, maybe I'll be better. All right, so anyway, well, what does an infectious disease specialist do? And I'll just get the entry key. And uh, you know, people might think that I, I sit at a bench in a lab and I look at petri dishes with cultures, and uh, but that's what the microbiology people do. Uh, and there are microbiology uh, uh, people with master's degrees and PhDs who are researchers, and there are also people who work in hospitals and laboratories who are uh, microbiology technicians who I used to work with very closely. And this is my license plate, and uh, a, lo a lot of my work involved just seeing people who were uh, running fevers, and why? And uh, there was a thing actually, uh, there's a whole chapter in the big book called Fever of Unknown Origin that I had to uh, very closely uh, go back to time and time again. Okay, so there, here's the fantastic world of microbiology. And uh, it was a very interesting field. Not very lucrative, but very interesting. I enjoyed it. Uh, now I'm going to apologize because I'm going to describe the textbook that was the tome of our existence, uh, the Mandel textbook. And you see it was, uh, the last time it was on the market that I looked it up last year was 410 bucks. And uh, usually came in two volumes, but I was able to take advantage of the hospital library being online so I could look things up. So I, uh, although I bought this several times over the years, uh, the last decade or so, I didn't have to buy one because I could just go out and take Thing. But, and I'm going to apologize now, I'm going to rattle through the table of contents so you sort of get to know what I did. Uh, the first section was basic principles in the diagnosis and management of infectious diseases. So they talked about how organisms caused what they did, the pathogenesis, and what the host, the person, 
could bring against them, you know, what military uh, we could have to fight off those invaders. Then there's the epidemiology of infectious diseases and clinical microbiology. Uh, then there was a whole thing about the antibiotics that you could use, and these are all different categories of antimicrobials. And you see the fourth one from the top is penicillins. And then there's a whole chapter uh, a little farther down, beta-lactam allergy, penicillin allergy. We have to know a lot about that stuff. And uh, antifungal things, antiparasitic items, antiviral things. Uh, then there are major clinical syndromes. So we talk about, here's a section on fever. Three, three separate chapters on fever. Uh, then the by body system, upper respiratory infections. Then lower respiratory infections, pleural pulmonary and bronchial infections. Urinary, intra-abdominal, general sepsis, cardiovascular, central nervous system infections, skin and skin tissue, uh, or soft tissue infections, gastrointestinal, bone and joint infections, diseases of reproductive organs and STDs, eye infections. Never saw many eye infections because the eye doctors usually took care of that stuff at home. Uh, hepatitis and acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, miscellaneous. Then we're getting into smaller and smaller prints. Here's a list of the viral, not diseases, but their families that the diseases fit into. And right in the middle here, uh, it's too small for me to read, but Flavy viruses, uh, Ebola would fit into that, but I never had to see a case uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, prion diseases like mad cow, uh, chlamydial diseases, mycoplasma, rickettsia, ehrlichiosis, and anaplasmosis. A long list of bacterial diseases, uh, some of which I never saw, but uh, I knew the names anyway, and if, uh, if somebody mentioned it to me, I, I knew where to look it up. Mycoses are the fungal diseases, protozoal are the one-celled parasitics, and then there's toxic algae. Elements are the worm infections. Ectoparasite things are like lice and scabies, and diseases of unknown etiology, Kawasaki syndrome. Then there was uh, special problems, uh, like nosocomial infections. I was the, for my hospital, I was the chief epidemiology uh, officer and have a single separate job there about infection control within the hospital. Then infections in special hosts like uh, patients with uh, anti-inflammatory agents. You know, they had special infections that they would get that might be, be uh, treated for myositis, for instance. Uh, okay, biodefense zoonosis. So there, I'm sorry about that. I had to go through. All right, anyway, the, the, the thing says, uh, uh, the doctor is looking in there, looking at his skin and says, oh my God, there are billions of them. And the patient says, oh my God, well, of, of what doctor? Billions of what? And so we're talking about the germs, and they look pretty sinister and gangster-like, and but usually they're not so unfriendly. And there is something called a post-parasite relationship. Uh, this is a water buffalo over in Asia, and you see the little bird on its back? It's an oxpecker, and they live together. The, first of all, they, uh, the water buffalo doesn't mind them being here, and especially since he, it picks lice and things off its back. So the uh, water buffalo benefits from him being there, and the oxpecker benefits from him because he gets his meal there. So, Bacteria and us have that kind of relationship to a large degree. So support bacteria, it's the only culture some people have. <laughs> okay, so now for instance, uh, bacteria in our gut take vitamin K and produce one of our clotting agents. And if we didn't have those bacteria, we'd have a problem and it's like you would be on warfarin, you know, uh, cumin and blood thinner without bacteria. So uh, that's one of the areas where bacteria help. And, okay, so various kinds of germs, bacteria, virus, yeast, and molds are included here. Now, uh, we have a defense against those organisms. And we're going to call it the immune system. It's not just one little thing. 
It's sort of like the military has the Air Force and the Navy and the Army, and then within the Army we have the cavalry and uh, the foot soldiers and the communication systems and all kinds of separate little things, and that's the concept. You don't have to memorize all the stuff I'm going to throw at you as far as little names. So I don't think this is going to work because it moves, but uh, all right. What this is is not a frog, but it's this, uh, the company that made this little digital uh, video that I picked off the internet and showed a dead rabbit decomposing. It's a time-lapse thing that goes on over five, six days. And the bacteria on or within that dead rabbit are decomposing that thing. And it's a very dramatic thing because this rabbit just basically disappears down to fur. And uh, because it must have been a nice, warm, humid set of days, and this thing just decimated. And but for, if we were, as we thought, oh, think death, rabbit did not get to the mortician in time to get the formaldehyde to stop that process going. But that process was for lack of an immune system and all of those defenses that we have against infection, which are good. And we'll also call it the inflammatory system. So otherwise harmless germs can be, take the opportunity at the time of uh, decreased immunity to not be harmless anymore. So they are opportunists, and we call it opportunistic infections. They take advantage of a weakened host condition. Okay. Long ago, there was, uh, I think it was some Greek physician, who described inflammation as having four components. The cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, and pain. And then more recently, it's, they said that things don't work so good because of that. So loss of function was a fifth one that was added to that. And so uh, heat is fever. Redness is, you know, you get a mosquito bite, for instance. It gets red, it gets swollen, and it gets painful in a very simple little thing, a mosquito bite. Okay? Now you ask, why would fever be helpful? How does that help fight off an infection? I'll uh, try. Let me show you about the blizzards. Okay, this is Diplosaurus dorsalis. It's uh, commonly known as the desert iguana. And as you know, the lizards and snakes and fish, and not birds and mammals, are uh, not warm blooded. They take on the whatever temperature of their environment. Okay. So if it's 70 degrees, the internal temperature of this lizard is 70 degrees. However, the lizard may choose to be warm. So it might go into the shade to cool off. And it might go sit on a sunny lot to warm up. Okay. So it can choose. There is something where it can get in control and it's told to go to these places, as opposed to us, we just burn a little bit more kind of fuel if we're all in the cold, but we still stay at that one set temperature around 98, 99 degrees. So, researchers back in the 70s did this very intriguing uh, experiment. They had a cage or a pen with the lizards in it, and they had a warm end with the sun lamps and a cool end without the sun lamps. Okay? They injected a bacteria into some of the lizards, and they would, they can't run a fever, but they can choose to be in a warmer place. So they would go over into the sunlight area, and they would get through their infection. On the other hand, if they were restricted from going from the cool end to the warm end, they all died. So that's just an example of how the inflammation, even though we don't really have a good handle on it, and in this case, fever helps fight off an infection. Okay, let's talk about some of the infections. Here's the 10 plagues visited on the Egyptians at the time of uh, Exodus. And number five is animals died from disease. 
We believe that was it. Number six was boils. Okay, so let's talk about boils. Okay, now I'm going to start using the poker again. Is that show up? Is the poker show up there? No, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to have to leave my hand here. Okay, this is skin. And, uh, oh, look, there's a setting on here that we're going to poker with. Nobody's jumping into my system. Okay, anyway, this is normal skin, and you see there's a hair follicle coming out of here, and associated with that is a, um, a, a sweat gland, or a well gland, and here's a sweat gland. So there are openings to the skin where germs, like these guys are here, can go down and go deep. Okay, and when that happens, they set up a housekeeping bottom of the thing, and you can set up a little infection that we said, all these drugs on the surface. Okay, so here's staph goes, and staph, staph meant coccus, coccus means little balls, and staph in Greek meant grapes, and you can see that it's sort of clustered up like clusters of grapes, and we'll contrast that later to the structural design, which are the shoulders of the shoulders, balls and shoulders. Okay, so that if you have a, a little hair follicle infection, it's called orthopeditis, and you can have a whole fledged boil like this one, which would be uh, a small abscess or a urinal, or you can have a real big one like a carbon. And when it gets up to something like this, it needs to see a surgeon to have it ready if you want to just get the blood and toss it out. But the body, if it's a mild infection, can usually take care of this because the germs are coming in, say with a break in the skin with a splinter, uh, there are some sensing, uh, part of the military, there's sensing cells that send out signals to the bloodstream and a phagocytic cell. Phagocytic means a cell that eats. And we want these things to be climbed up so it goes after the bacteria and eats the bacteria. So fluid comes in here, and there's the swelling as the blood uh, particle side of the blood. And the germs come in and get red because more, more blood supply comes through. But like these cells then eat the germs, and there's a little pocket of pus there that we saw in the previous pictures. And uh, very often it also helps to let that stuff come out. So that's the pus that you see in the boil on that. This is what uh, Staph aureus looks like to the microbiology technician in the lab. They take a specimen, say on a swab, and they squeak it on a blood water uh, that is 5% sheet blood. And it comes out with a little column. Wherever there was one germ, it becomes a colony of millions to form these larger colonies overnight. And they are experiments that have to look at that as you have staph and staph aureus that have them, not the harmless when it's on all of our skins. So interestingly, there was a researcher named Fleming back in the uh, in, uh, Great Britain back in the 20s who just pulled out an old plate out of the drawer and you can see that uh, he had all of these colonies that were growing here with the staph germs, but there was also some mold growing up here. And around the mold, the staff didn't grow. And that mold was penicillium mold. And from that, it was published that uh, lay there for about a decade. And so two other guys came along just at the start of World War II, Chicken and Flory. And they, uh, with uh, Fleming, uh, created penicillin. Uh, and they just got extra excellent this substance that came out of the mold. And it, it was found to be killed a lot of the bacteria. The trouble is that penicillin doesn't work for a lot of these bacteria anymore because you overuse it. And now we have superbugs that have grown out of overuse of antibiotics. So we try not to give antibiotics for every little thing and we try to be very selective about which infections that we get antibiotics. Now here's another, in the simplest terms, if that antibiotic kills 
99% of the jurors. Now there's going to be 1% left over. And without the competition from the other 99%, it's going to sort of take over that little space that it's living in. And then if it comes along with the analog again, it will be more resistance. So if you kill all the sensitive ones, what's left? The resistance. That's in the simplest way. There's no problem. Now that we talked about pus for little abscesses, uh, viral infections work a little bit different. So uh, a lot of times people would come in to see me because they had a particular antibody in their system. And I would explain about that antibody. It doesn't mean you have that infection. It means you have that infection. So and I use mumps as the example. So any of us who have had mumps, especially older, as opposed to those who've gotten the MMR vaccination, we've had mumps. There was a response of our immune system to create antibodies which helped in eradicating mumps when we were that kid. But we can still have that antibody circulating in our system that now protects us from ever getting mumps again. Okay. So it protects us, and it's also a flag that you had it in the past and you're immune. So very often we'll uh, uh, do a test just to see if somebody has the antibody. Says, oh, you're not susceptible to that. You know, other infections, uh, it's not not the case. So this is a very complicated slide, and I won't have a good pointer, but I'll try. So the virus comes into the cell and into the body and a macrophage, that's part of the military, uh, detects it and sends off some signals to a helper T cell and to a B cell. The B cell becomes a plasma cell which makes antibodies. Okay. The T cell also becomes a killer cell, also called a cytotoxin, and that helps so together, they control the infection at that time. Okay. Uh, so there's the humoral antibody, the antibody system, humoral immunity, that makes antibodies, but also there's a cellular component, which, with the antibody, helps to uh, gobble up those viruses and the cells that, are, that they're growing with. Yeah. Okay, so those, the infected cell breaks down and gets get rid of it. Okay. So, a hundred years ago, they figured out about antibodies and they said, well, gee, people with diphtheria who survive, they never get it again. And diphtheria was a, well, not a virus, but it's a bacteria, but uh, people would never get diphtheria again. And it's a toxin, so they would make a toxoid. They would take the toxin from the diphtheria, denature it so it was not poisonous anymore, and inject it into your skin. You would develop an immunity to the diphtheria toxin, and you'd never get to the diphtheria. Okay? So tetanus works the same way. That's a toxin. So that's an uh, uh, antigen of denatured toxin is used and not the actual poison. And uh, the pertussis is the other one that's in there, so there's another one. But that one is actually uh, uh, actual uh, bacteria that is altered. So that is recognized as being so close to the actual germ that it, it's useful to create a artificially, but it works. Okay, now I'm a bit of a movie buff, and I want you, I want to know who recognizes this person, and I'll be amazed if anybody knows. Now I'll get to that. Anybody seen this movie, Song of Bernadette? Okay, all right. This was uh, uh, Bernadette Subaru, who saw the vision of uh, Mary and Lourdes, and. Everybody goes there for the waters. So uh, in the movie, uh, she was cloistered in a nunnery, and uh, the mean mother superior said, You haven't suffered enough to be here. You're worthy here. And then she showed her leg, and 
We never knew what that thing was that was on her leg. But, uh, Mother Superior then gasped and said, oh my, and she was uh, very sorry about it. So anyway, she died of that disease, which was tuberculosis. Well, how did that get to her leg? Well, also, uh, tuberculosis was very, very common back in those days and well into the last century. And a lot of famous people either had it, these people died of it, uh, or complications from it. Uh, but the law, it's a long, long list of people who had it and didn't die. So what about TB? Right, this is a germ that if coughed out, uh, have, goes off in a little mucus thing that hangs in the air for hours. And people who then breathe it in uh, get a bit of a oh, pneumonia from it in their lungs. Okay, and then uh, it actually gets into the bloodstream and goes everywhere. But the immune system then comes in and clamps down on it and you become okay. All right. Uh, five to ten percent have residual stuff that you can see on a chest x-ray though. And uh, that can still reactivate and go on to some really bad stuff. Okay. Uh, when it does go into the bloodstream, it goes anywhere in the body. And so uh, Bernadette had it in her bowl. Of course, they, they would have had to amputate it to, uh, to take care of that. I don't think they did that. Okay, the natural history. This is just going over that same thing. And uh, so the, the bacteria come in, there is infection, and to a large extent in that four to six weeks, uh, it comes under control. And the uh, bacteria, this is a microbacteria, are controlled. And initially there is control of that, and then there are little calcifications that can still occur in the lungs and can be seen on a chest x-ray. So very often a chest x-ray is a screening tool to see that. Uh, all right, and so then that can be encased in a little jail, and that can go on for lifelong. The trouble is, if there is something happens to the immunity, these bacteria can break out of the jail and reactivate and cause some really bad pulmonary disease. Okay, and then they become contagious and they start the whole process over coughing out lots of germs into the air. Uh, my favorite story was the guy from Turkey who came into my hospital and he had cavitary, really bad cavitary tuberculosis. Guess what his job was? Cab driver. So the health department took over from there. So here's another thing we can do. We can take an extract from TB germs, kill germs, uh, just some substance of that, put it into a syringe, and we can inject it into the arm of somebody to do a tuberculin skin test. And if that test two days later, it becomes a little bubble, but the bubble goes away. But if there is swelling and redness, we can measure that, and that is an indicator that somebody has had exposure to TB germs in the past, even if they have a normal chest x-ray. So that used to be, because TB was much more common in the past, a screening test, and certainly any healthcare worker would have to have a TB skin test in order to be employed. And if they had a reactive test, they would then have a chest x-ray to show they didn't have contagious tuberculosis. Okay? Now somebody with a positive skin test with having been exposed to tuberculosis uh, might have a 10% chance of reactivation sometime during their life. Now that 10% could be reduced to just 1% by taking one of the TB drugs for nine months called isoniazid or INH. And some might be familiar with that. So that was a very useful test. Sure. At the end. Working my way over there. 
Okay, so anyway, there are, uh, this is the white blood cell lineages, and this is part of that variety of military that we have. Uh, so we talked about things that come from the bone marrow, and the pus cell is here, the monocyte, the embryonic cell, and in the tissue there are cells from the lymph nodes, and T cells and B cells, which you don't have to memorize. I just want to emphasize the variety of parts of the military that we have. Okay, this is also, there are a few other things that are helpful. Barriers, skin, mucous membranes, saliva, the flushing action of urine and tears, stomach acid. Those are all things that help us uh, fend off infection. And things that are all the stuff that is in the bloodstream. Okay, so now we've talked about the inflammatory response to infection. We've talked a little bit about uh, antibiotics. I know we have to be careful about that. So everything is wonderful. We shouldn't have any problems. But Murphy's Law is that if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. And so let's start with this guy. Anybody recognize him? Jim Henson, yes, from the main guy of the Muppets. Well, he got an infection that was so overwhelming that uh, he just went right up down into his and died. And what can happen is that uh, sometimes the immune system can overreact okay, and cause vascular collapse and shock, septic shock. And what happens is that the body tries to retain blood supply for the internal organs, and then it picks out things that can be sacrificed, like blood supply to the limbs, blood supply to less vital organs. And so uh, septic shock uh, can occur from a variety of, of things, burns, uh, urinary tract infections, peritonitis, as we mentioned, septic abortion, right in the, the back alleys. And here's an example of you didn't get blood supply to, to, that, to the extremities. And yeah, this might be a case of lingococcus. Uh, spinal meningitis is usually lingococcus meningitis. There's lots of other meningitis that uh, are in this manner. So, point number two was the immune system, the inflammatory response infection, can overshoot with sepsis. And here's something that goes wrong. We'll uh, use the word raggedy. Now here's the immune system reacting to something which isn't an infection. Okay, so the first time the allergy came in person, runs across the allergy, raggedy, he or she makes large amounts of antibody, and they attach themselves to that cell. And the second time, now that person is sensitive to raggedy. Even though there hasn't been any action But then the next time they come across angry, everything breaks loose and all of their cells release their histamine and the mass cells go crazy. So allergic reactions can be by skin uh, things that come in by skin contact, injection, ingestion, or inhalation. And you'll see that the medications are several places here. Uh, and the bander can be either by the one or the other. So there's another place where the immune system can go a lot. And it needs an antibody to control that. So now we have a third a response to a non infection allergy. Who's this? Bobby Darren, and you remember he died at a fairly young age. And what happened to him was, he has rheumatic fever as a kid. Rheumatic fever starts off in response, a bad response, to a streptococcal infection, usually the sort of adult. The immune system comes in, reacts to the strep infection, and really helps to take care of it and knock that down. But there is cross-reactivity to other parts of the body, in particular to the inside of the heart. And the, and the heart valves. And so people can then go on to develop a traumatic heart disease, and usually it was a micro valve that was damaged. And 
golden years where a lot of people, uh, as they got older, they had to have their own valves replaced because they were not worse and worse. Okay, so this is a, also there's also a skin rash that's associated with that. And there are five main parts. So the carditis is the traumatic heart disease, polyarthritis is part of that. Uh, skin rash is the European large one. Korea is a Woody Guff, we have the hunting piece Korea. This is uh, sitting lands Korea, but it's uh, ear muscle movements Korea. And uh, something to me is not a good as well as the skin. Now, strep infection looks like this, but also the viral infection can look like that. The strep infection for girls are arranged chains uh, as opposed to grapes in the staff. It looks like this if you take the culture of the girl. Like the biology tech to look at that. So we yeah, have that's a new day strep. Uh, uh, whoever did this little uh, diagram here thought they could tell the difference between a viral uh, sore throat and a bacterial sore throat or strep It's uh, there's a huge overlap though. So again, we don't want to give antibiotics to everybody with and uh, we do want to know that they've got strep. No reason to get all lots, but because if people look at all this weapon actually is to get that So there, we now have a fourth thing, or a third thing where the immune system can go wrong. It can cross-react with something within the body. You don't know who this guy is, but I think So David Better, who is you may have remembered back from those days, has been the boy in the public. He was born with no immune system. So he had to be protected from anything from the outside. Now we're going to call this primary immune deficiency because it's primary because he never had an immune system. And he had his defect right away. He wasn't created with any of it. And there are all kinds of congenital <laughs> things that can go wrong with the immune system. His was se severe combined uh, immunodeficiency, SCID, and he was missing his whole arm of his immune system. Now, the defects are different. You have a defect in one area, and that sort of predicts that you're going to have problems with a particular set of infections. It's sort of like if you're lacking the air force, you are susceptible to a certain impact. You're lacking the uh, artillery system, you're susceptible to other types of behaviors. And so the defect often predicts what kind of infection And that's true for the not only the primary immunodeficiency, but also the acquired So there we have a primary immunodeficiency. Uh, you probably have to be from Milwaukee to look at this guy. It's a real basketball player. This is Al McGuire, who was the uh, basketball coach for the Marquette Warriors. And he won the national title in the uh, late 70s. He then became a uh, very uh, colorful color man for the basketball uh, broadcast. Uh, but he ended up with a few basketball. Now this is a normal blood smear, and there are red cells really, and white blood cells. And usually the ratio is 500 to 1. Somebody with leukemia has all too many white blood cells, particularly thymine white blood cell, either neutrophils uh, or lymphocytes, and they overwhelm the uh, first the bone and then the peripheral blood, and their immune system This is a, he had a small part in this movie, but I don't know, 1950, 
Star was Duke's uh, leader. But a few years later, he took a risk of it. He worked uh, for about 60 years. He looked like this back then. And of course, you know, he had HIV and AIDS. And AIDS, it turns out, uh, their immune system goes down to again, it's usually certain infections that may become prone to cancer. Not all infections. For instance, staph infections are not a big problem. A lot of these other ones where the T cells are really important. And in particular, there's something called a CD4 cell that's important for fighting off these infections. CD4. Okay, so here I've got to follow this along. This is target 3 gyne So this shows me how the virus gets into the cell and it's, it's got a favorite cell. So in the same way that hepatitis virus likes liver cells. The HIV virus likes CD4 cells. And so the main cell that fights HIV is also the main same target for HIV. So it bonds onto the surface, it fuses, it enters the cell. Uh, there's an enzyme that uh, is unimpeded in the cell and it makes the, uh, an enzyme that then reproduces itself. And then they're released and get more HIV cells to a very rapid sequence. So the bloodstream gets filled with these cells with HIV. And uh, I'll go to the next slide. So this is just a slide to uh, remind me to start waving my arms. Because okay. with my HIV patients, which I saw mainly in the office, them, I would each time tell them that when they're starting out with HIV, your viral load, which is the virus, is up here, and you're starting out with the CD4 count up here. But over months and usually years, the virus is going to get the upper hand, and those good guys, the CD4 cells, drop down and down and down. Until they get down to the low, say 200, and then they're not only losing the battle against HIV, but they're wide open to all of those other infections. So they have acquired an immune deficiency syndrome that they didn't have while they were up here, but now they have an acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, AIDS. So you can have HIV infection up here. AIDS was defined when you were down here, either below 200 or getting one of those infections. Okay. So in the uh, 80s, we didn't have anything to treat the, the bad guys. We had uh, some individual uh, agents, uh, and we would use them one at a time, and we, it didn't work. They were, we had to wait to see if this thing, uh, if they were going to have another infection. So then, around the middle of the 90s, we, we got to the point where we could measure this and measure this, and then we can see much quicker if we were having an effective thing. The other thing is we're using cocktails of antiviral agents. And then we started to knock this stuff down, and these guys would start to gradually come up again. So each time I would see the patients uh, a week before, I'd say, you get your CD4 count, and get your HIV viral load, and we'll talk about it when we come in to see them. So, uh, up to about 1995, we were burying a lot of uh, patients at the scene, and then after that, it got better. So here we have an in inflammatory system attacked by an infection, HIV and AIDS. Okay, this lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay, in 1961 or 1962, she got sick, and it looked like she had leukemia because she had this huge white blood cell count in her bloodstream. So there was this new wonder drug that was pulled out, and she got it, and it was something that was brand new at the time called cortisol. So she got her cortisol, and basically what she had, though, was a reactivation of tuberculosis. 
this wash, this knocked down her immune system, and she died because of the now we know the inappropriate use of an anti-inflammatory agent in a dangerous way while somebody has the infection. Okay, so uh, cortisone is right here in the body. It's cortisol, and it was really very similar. Uh, this whole this the steroids, and the, the thing that we make uh, steroids out of is cholesterol. So you have to have some, and then there are a whole chain of things here for uh, fluid and um, salt control. Uh, we have sex hormones over here. We have female and male sex hormones here. And so when the athletes are taking steroids, they're taking just that one arm of that. And so we have a cartoon here that says, Buck, are you sure that guy that gives you the steroids is giving you the right stuff? So uh, the adrenal glands are little glands that sit on top of the renals, which are the kidneys. And so they are uh, it means on top of the kidneys. And so those glands make a lot of hormones, but including cortisol. So uh, they get a signal to make it uh, from the pituitary gland. And uh, there's a balance. If you need a little bit more, if you're under some stress, you pump out a little bit more. If you're, everything's relaxed, then you have a little less. So one of the responses to infection is you need a little bit more. Now why would you need more cortisone when you're having an infection? Well, it's sort of like this. For every, that's Newton's thing, for every response, there has to be an equal response. So that, like, if you're pulling in one direction, you don't want your fever to go to 108. You want a little bit something to damp it down so that you have a fever but not 108. Okay, so you need some when you're under stress, not too much. So that regulation is a very fine thing. Now, on the other hand, if you're taking prednisone, which is the next slide, prednisone is artificially manufactured cortisol, which people with myositis might be on, depending on their type of myositis. That's sort of like you're getting your uh, supply of stuff from China. And when you're getting your stuff from China, you close down the factory. So the adrenal glands and the pituitary gland that signal for it to be made shut down until you don't need it, until the China sh uh, uh, stops supplying it. Okay. Uh, when China stops supplying it, then yours kicks in again. But if you're on it for too long, the factory stays closed. And so then people who have been on steroids for too long have to be on a little bit of steroids every day of their life so that they don't overreact to all the stresses of their life. And when they have a stress, they have to take a little bit more. Yes, sir. Did you say on it for too long, you can pull apart for how long? Oh, um, more than months. More than months. More than months? Yeah, and very often it's people who have been on it for years. Their factory is closed down, and so they have to stay on some of the uh, exogenous uh, stuff and uh, regulate themselves when they recognize when they're having the stress. But for instance, if you're going through surgery, the anesthesiologist uh, knowing that you've been on uh, steroids and your factory's closed will give you extra steroids for the stress of the surgery. Okay, you need surgery, and um, they could aggravate it and send them to the and I'm going to drop the side of the and the rest of my mind and threaten them. Okay, I, uh, you must have had an infection of, the, of that uh, knee replacement. Three, and that's the three infections. And I would have been uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sure when you're on the, uh, the uh, cortical steroid, probably after that, unless you were on it for some other reason. Low dose. Low dose, okay. All right, but you're an, an example of what I'm saying. They're afraid, okay. Okay, so you're on a suppressive dose of that toxicity before the infection is. Okay. 
the orthopedic surgeon that did that operation, if he did me do it, he did my shoulder. I had rotator cuff injury seven times. I didn't get an infection, but I didn't recover. This is Okay, well, I, you have a bad outcome, I guess. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, I'm going to keep going. I heard that shit. They've been called a fashion. Yeah, okay. Why did it get worse than your hospital? Let's save that to the end. Let me do it. That's, uh, uh, we'll save that to the end. All right, so anyway, we have uh, the mules, the inflammatory system now weakened by medicine medically. Now here's an example of the, the immune system just attacking itself. Now if there was ragweed sending this off, we would call that an allergy. If we had an infection causing that, like rheumatic fever damaging the body, we would call that uh, a, a, a post-infectious complication of that infection. But here we don't recognize that exact thing that is setting off the immune system. Okay? So we have a whole list of various organs that can be affected uh, by the immune system. We're going to call those autoimmune diseases. We don't have a very good manifest or uh, representation for our biosynthesis. We do have also the myosthenia gravis, which is uh, not within the myositis area. But, uh, and we have a longer list of things that uh, are, we know are all in and sometimes we wonder if some of these things like schizophrenia or So, no, that's not a weird, that's a, somebody put it into the list. <laughs> okay, and this, uh, I'm going to tell you, this is more than the VA than we had for the myositis. Although he was able to get a nice long run. And so here we have an inflammatory response against self, this time against muscle. So let's look at muscle. So we know that muscle is, uh, it has stuff like this, and it is a cross section, and then there's a little, if we go down more and more microscopically, we end up seeing this uh, cartoon of muscle, that the cross-section of the individual muscle fibers looks like this. And there are little septa bristles in between five, uh, sets of fibers, and little blood vessels that are there, and they look pretty good. Now, on the other hand, in polymyositis, we have all of these inflammatory cells that come in for no good reason. And they do damage to the muscle fibers. Dermatomyositis has not quite as many inflammatory cells, but uh, they are situated around the blood vessels, and they have a little bit characteristic. I'm not a pathologist, so I would be able to recognize this. Inclusion body myositis looks like that too, but it's got all of these particular things called in bubbles in there. And then some bubbles with the bodies within it, so the inclusions within the cells. So that's the inclusion bodies of the myocytes. So, in this one and in this one, poly and rheumatic, we can get anti inflammatory agents because these cells are causing damage to the muscles. In inclusion body myocytes, we give those agents and it doesn't seem to be Off the top of my head, I'm going to say that the implant and these things that are there are after the fact. And there is something about the immune system that we're not recognizing and using the right treatment yet, but that are working on it. Okay? So what we're seeing here is not the problem. Many cells are, are causing damage. These cells are these cells are there to mop up. The what? 
to mop up. Mop up. Yeah, they're their second miracle. That's off the top of my head, and in my head, it gives me a framework to understand why these anti-inflammatory agents don't work for IBM and why they do work for IBM. Well, there are eyes in those two slides. I'm sorry, uh, take a moment. Those two slides look the same, number two and number three. They don't, they can't come well, okay, in number or in this one here, yeah. which is the fusion body on the site, uh, there are these little bubbles in the cells. You see the little white things here? Yes. Okay, those are the vacuoles. Right. And in some of those, there are little structures. Okay? Uh, and those are the inclusions that aren't seen in these. But is that the only difference? Uh, another difference is, as I said, the little, uh, those inflammatory cells that we see there don't respond to the anti-inflammatory agents. So like you can get penicillin and it just doesn't seem to help. Whereas it does seem to help a lot of issues with the other Now that's my simple way of explaining that difference. That what we're seeing there is secondary now you'll hear a lot about the word amyloid, which is uh, there are little proteinaceous deposits that are also seen in uh, Alzheimer's. Okay, so, that, so there's that, there's that connection. Uh, I'm going to keep going because we're near the end. Uh, so the, the, the medications that are used for anti-inflammatory are here's prednisone, part of the steroids. What it does against the immune system and comments as far as how it works. These are by turning to the food you have, uh, methotrexines. And again, it, it does certain things to certain parts of the liver that we have. Uh, Cyclosporin, cyclophosphamine, that's also called cytoxin. Cell set is used in Transplants, also transplants, program up the back of the list. So I think this is a little bit as far back. Plaquenil, uh, IVID, and plasma freezer. So I'm basically done. Uh, you know, I'm a doctor who had never heard of um, the conclusion of IVID on the But uh, uh, I was lucky enough to walk into a neuromuscular specializing neurologist who recognized what I had just by my examination and my story. So I thought I was pretty lucky to get to a lot of people with their stories. So now we'll open it up for some questions. If you would, just wait till the microphone comes to you. Take a few extra seconds. And on the way, um, I'll just remind, remind everyone, please do fill out the evaluation forms here at the end. Oh, let me introduce Chris Dottor. Did I say that right? I said it Dor. Dor. Uh, also on the board. Many of us have taken drugs that are uh, some form of the immune system aggressive. Uh, how worried should we be about the fact that we're suppressing our immune system possibly not giving ourselves up for other infections. Uh, it depends on if you're still on it versus you were on it. Once you were on it and you're not as susceptible, of course, you're still susceptible to the stress of having been on long-term uh, cortisol and prednisol. So that's a, that can be a long-term thing. Usually the immune system comes back once you go off popular thing is the uh, biologics, you know, the like, uh, embryo, uh, renegade, uh, there's a whole list of biologics that we use that. So I you know, occasionally would see somebody who got sick while they were on that, and they would have to come off. I had a patient with uh, HIV and cancer psoriasis who did very well on him, uh, had to come off. Uh, there was a question I would just get back to the MR saying, why is it in the hospital? Well, sick people end up in the hospital, uh, and uh, 
with their infections, and very often they would have MRSA. The more resistant it was, the sicker they might get. And MRSA, uh, which are resistant staph infections, resistant to all of the beta lactams, kind of similar in the second floor. And so, uh, yes, it was more common in the hospital. We would put people in isolation who, who had that, and they would walk into their room and then walk out of it. Uh, 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 and hands, uh, to the next patient's room. I just want to ask, I was looking at your medication now, methotrexate, and seeing that it can cause cancer. How long do you think you can take it to be safe? I don't know that. Okay. I don't know how long. Uh, I would think that would be fairly rare. I know that there was a particular caution with methotrexate for people who live in the central part of the country for histoplasmosis. And some of the ads you hear now for biologics for uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, the doctor was supposed to ask you if you lived in certain parts of the country where certain mold or fungal infections were prevalent. Yeah. 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 Um, my my question goes directly with that. I was diagnosed with histoplasmosis mm -hmm. just about a year ago. I probably had it for a little longer. So I was wondering if you can. Um, talk about how other people could be affected by it and what things. Well, histoplasmosis is one of the it. infections that uh, uh, is, seems to be along the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. Where did you live? Where? Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay, and uh, the Missouri River Valley. Uh, but uh, up in Wisconsin, we had more blastomycosis uh, away from the uh, Mississippi rivers. Um, and uh, basically, it's spores that are inhaled, and they can set up a, a, an acute infection. But sometimes that can go on to the same process that tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis germs went through, and they're imprisoned. But with some something that comes along that weakens the immune system, like methotrexate, that becomes reactivated even years after uh, you're out of that area and uh, not newly inhaling the spores. Over, over here. Where are we? Oh, over here. <laughs> um, this is probably my 12th conference, and interestingly enough, I've never heard the fever discussion before today. Yes, um, I love uh, that story. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've had... Desert iguanas are so great. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't live in the desert. I live in Florida. Um, but. I did have a few doctors always ask me, do you get fevers? And I, ne I always said no. I never really questioned why they're asking me that. Because I was thinking of a full-fledged, you know, sweating and shaking and, you know, that type of fever. But the more I thought about it over the years and when I'm resting, I, I think I do have some sort of small type. Is it, is it the muscles that are shaking or well, what do you think the... Cause a fever like symptom, very slight, but enough that I'm now recognizing it. I wouldn't worry about it, first of all. Is that normal? Right, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, I think the question would be is that uh, if I was seeing somebody new, I would always ask if they had been running fever, especially in my field, and have you measured it? Uh, I don't know that you have measured the temperature with those episodes. Uh, there have been times where any of us have felt a little sweaty and uh, have ended up taking off our sweater uh, you know, at various times. And usually that's just the way the body regulates its own temperature, as opposed to how the desert iguana would regulate its temperature. Um, and in fact, with fever, there is a, a thermal uh, central uh, controlling area for fever to keep everything in the right place, but when it recognizes the need to have a fever, it would have a chill. And you generate heat, and the way the body loses heat is to have a sweat. And so that was often when somebody would have a shaking chill, that would be followed by a sweat, typically, to lose that heat from the generator. I have a question. Yes. I'm not sure that you answered one of the items in the agenda. And if you did, could you answer it again? What? To read it, I It is important to know how the pathology of your underlying disease 
dot, 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 may influence your susceptibility to infection. I don't, I can't get it. Okay. We went from infection down to the disease, right. but then how does it go back up to infection? I think uh, for infection, it's more you know, what medications you're on to treat the myositis that then makes you susceptible, that, that which is the... Immune suppressant. Yeah. Okay. That's all? All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Question for you, Mary. You listed uh, plasma paresis. Yes. As the end. And that's the first I have heard of this. Who's doing that? Well, I don't know that anyone's doing it for myositis. I know that there are certain conditions, and the thing that pops right into my head is called uh, TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, where there's a problem of platelets. Uh, so they have low platelets, hemolytic uh, anemia, uh, fever. Uh, renal failure and confusion, those five things, and that's a particular syndrome that we recognize, and we call it a hematologist, usually hematology, oncology, because of the problem of the platelets, and the treatment for that is to run all of their blood out of their body, filter it, and then run the better the filtered blood back in, and that's called plasmapheresis. So that's a, something that is used for some inflammatory conditions. I wasn't putting that up there as a treatment for myositis. Okay. Well. well, I didn't say it like that. I have a question. It may... Where are we? Oh. I'm hiding on the front row. Uh, one of the slides that you had was a table of the various medications that were used and how they impacted the immune system. Yes. Yeah. And so perhaps uh, the other the other question, and I just want to try to get this clear in my mind, is that depending on what medication that we're on, those areas of the immune system are going to be impacted. And certain the, parts of the military will be correct. flawed. Right. Okay. So then um, various disease or various bacteria or infectious agents will be more likely to infect people on Plaquenil as opposed to people on Rituximab or something yes. like that. So that's that's your connection right. then. Okay. So if we go back to that, let me ask them this question. So if you're taking Rituximab, if you've had infusions of Rituximab, so theoretically your B cells are gone, at least for a period of time. And so one of your slides, I believe, said the B cell um, that it went to treat. Uh, that some of the, the bacteria would be like the strep pneumo and, and those type things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give you one question. This may be more of an immunology question than an infectious disease specifically. But what can we do? Does it, does it really, um, is it beneficial for us to take the pneumovax or the new 26? Yeah, all right. for, because if, if we're not, if that part of the, the system is affected, that one, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, is what made the antibody or the antigen is presented. Uh, right. No, I'm pretty sure out? that the antibody producing R, that part of the military, is still intact. And so, uh, uh, they, 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 even while you're on it, I'm pretty sure, by checking your doctor, uh, still take those vaccinations. On the other hand, there are certain live vaccinations, like influenza is a live virus. It's just knocked down so it won't cause and uh, won't cause influenza. And so there are some cautions with certain live virus vaccinations if you're on an immunosuppressant already. Okay, it's about 5.25. We still do have time, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Dr. Martin will uh, stay here and answer questions. The wine and cheese does start at 5.30, but feel free to stay and ask questions. Yeah. Doctor, what is the difference in treating a patient with myositis and one without myositis if they get pneumonia or strep or staph? Uh... If somebody is, uh, is with myositis is on an immunosuppressive agents, 
your, your treatment will be more difficult as opposed to somebody with a normal immune system to help out along with the treatment or the modalities of uh, just whatever their need to get ordinary pneumonia taken care of. Uh, it's just more difficult. And they may have a more deep-seated infection because of the immunosuppressors. Uh, if, uh, if you see something going on that might be an infection, let your doctor know. Yeah, don't sit there and wait it out, is the, the main thing. Otherwise, just do all the good things for yourself uh, that you should be doing as far as living your life with exercise and good nutrition and cleanliness. And uh, avoid people that you know have bad and dangerous things. I have two questions. Um, how does the gut bacteria affect the immune system? The bacteria in your gut. Oh, in the uh, in the GI tract. Yeah. And then the other was, um, how can we strengthen our immune system without triggering more problems with myositis? Uh, the bacteria in the gut. It's just nice to have a good mix of those germs and not knock down the usual ones so that there are uh, agents there that can really cause problems. The obvious example would be Clostridium difficile, which is a uh, more and more common problem that we see after antibiotics have selected it out by knocking down the more susceptible uh, bacteria in the GI tract and leaving these more resistant ones. And then we have big problems with it uh, secreting a toxin which affects the lining of the bowel and causing the diarrhea and people get off the sick and very often they have relapses a uh, month or two or three later. Uh, how to uh, strengthen your immune system otherwise? Just to keep on top of your, your health, do all those good things. Don't smoke. Don't use the street drugs. All, all those things. Looks like one more question here in the back. I just had a question. On, um, I've been on long-term high doses of steroid, and um, the doctor said that I could probably never go below 18 or 15. What is a normal person's... All right, well, the 18 would be because if you went too low, then your reason for being on it would react to it. And I right. actually had went into crisis because they got me down to 15 and I... So even 15 wasn't enough to control your primary disease process. On the other hand, if that comes under control, uh, you would never, you would actually come down to about five milligrams, which is about what the body produces normally. However, if you got a cold or something like bronchitis, uh, you would need more than the five, maybe ten or fifteen, just during that to get you over the hump of that stress. Because your own body would be making for that stress. Okay. Okay, looks like that's it. Um